and this Thursday it will be the 60th anniversary when TV, television, came to the Midlands. The Sutton Coalfield transmitter was opened on the 17th of December 1949 and it's changed the lives of people all across the region. This is the moment, coming up, when Sylvia Peters first broadcast from the region. But just bear in mind, this is old recorded, so it hasn't got the quality of today. Here she is, Sylvia Peters. Good evening, everybody. This is a very exciting moment for us in television, but tonight I'm not speaking to you from the familiar studios at Alexandra Palace, but from a small room in the new transmitting station at Sutton Coldfield. On behalf of the BBC, I offer a special greeting and a warm welcome to our new viewers in the Midlands. What a smashing piece and the style of broadcasting of style of speech, pronunciation, etc. Really interesting. A small room in Sutton Coalfield. We're going to be talking a lot more about the in the middle hour about broadcasting locally and its history. Now you've got to be of a certain age because we've been talking off air here at the moment, Richard Jeffs and Chris Perry from Kaleidoscope, a social historian, Terry Stanton from the Royal Television Society, uh, Richard from uh, the Ryan Collection Limited. We've been talking about our uh, memories of TV. We're going to get more memories in a moment, but you've got to be of a certain age because ITV, and in particular ABC, was mentioned. And I went straight away, Auntie Jean, put my forefinger of my right hand over my nose and bowed my head. Now, only those of us over, I think, probably 50, Richard... Oh, pr- no, no, well, you may think that I couldn't possibly... <laughs> ...would remember Auntie Jean and the Tinker and Tucker Club. <laughs> That's right, yes. So more of that to come in a moment. <laughs> so I hope you're all doing it with us, because when Chris... When Chris was looking at us as if it was Barbie. What did he say? <laughs> no, I, I don't know the origins of Tinker and Tucker. <laughs> Thought how inconsequential they were at the time. You wouldn't have bowed with such deference. Now it was Joe. Poor Joe was looking, thinking, "What is Carl doing, bowing his head with his forefinger <laughs> on his nose?" <laughs> the Tinker and Soccer Club. Listen, we're going to be talking about the history of television in our region. Sixty years of television in the Midlands. That's what we're celebrating this week. Sixty years ago, the Sutton Coalfield transmitter was opened. The Postmaster General. Sir Wilfrid Paley was there and he made this speech. This day will bring to the BBC television service a new and large audience. An audience drawn from the Midlands of England. It is hard to say exactly how large this will be until the effective range of the new station has been tried out in actual operation. But I can say that from tonight onwards at least one third of our total population will be within range of television. In recent years, the scope of the BBC's television programme has been steadily widened and this process will continue. This progressive policy should bring an ever-increasing flow of interest and entertainment. You got so engrossed in that, Chris Perry, that you were talking. I go, shut up, quick, cut, cut. <laughs> Terry, that was, of course, Sir Wilfrid Paley, the Postmaster General, talking about the opening of the Sutton Coalfield Transmitter. You've got a story about this, haven't you? Well, yes, I saw a film of this. Um, my job, incidentally, has been to transfer all sorts of films and things, old films to video. And there was a, um, a film made of that particular opening. I believe it was at the transmitter itself. It was amazing how um, there was n- not the sort of slick presentation yeah. that we have these days. Um, there were three or four dignitaries. There was the Postmaster General, there was the Lord Mayor, and I think probably the Lady Mayor are sitting at this table with flowers on. And um, in not the relaxed atmosphere that we have these days, stood up in a very yeah. formal yeah. way to, yeah. to present the, yeah. the, the programme. But yes, um, those, those really were the days, and uh, yes, certain age, you're quite right, Carl. Yes. <laughs> I will be talking with two other men of a certain age, and one that is not of a certain age, straight after the travel. <laughs> Delighted to have in the studio with me now Chris Perry, who is a television historian based in Birmingham, and associated with Kaleidoscope Publishing. We've got Richard Jeffs from the BAME Collection. He's going to tell us what that's all about in a little while. And we've got the man himself, Terry, who is from the Royal... Terry Stanton from the Royal Television Society and a man with a multitude of memories. Isn't that right, Tess? One or two. <laughs> One or two. <laughs> Terry, let me just ask you, what are your first memories of television? very first memories of television was back in about, I think it was 1951, when my father bought a TV set. Um, 
it was quite a crude affair. Uh, Marconi phone it was, 10-inch TV set. And I remember he actually made the aerial for it, which was two, two strips of copper, which were nailed to a, a seven-foot length of timber, which we pushed up in the loft, and a great thick cable, which was the earth, which ran outside to an outside water tap. Yeah. Um, it was it was quite a quite an event because I remember the um, 1951 Festival of Britain uh, being yeah. televised from there. Uh, then, sadly, the event of the death of George the yes. Sixth, which uh, filled me with floods of tears as a youngster yeah. Uh, yeah. watching this. It was a very very emotive thing, and then. The event of the decade, of course, followed the coronation. The coronation. The coronation. 53? Yes, yes. So 52, the death of the the king. The the, the death of the king was 52. So, I mean, when you've got, within the first two years of getting the TV, 51, you've got the Festival of Britain, the next year you've got the death of the monarch, and then the following year, the coronation. The coronation, yes, we were all around the set for the whole day, the whole day long, and, of course, all the neighbours came in to watch, because there weren't many TVs around in those days, and an enormous screen, it was all of 10 inches. 10 inches. (laughs) All of 10 inches. And uh, two or three years later, the neighbours got a whopper, which was really 14 inches. 14 inch TV, Carl. Talk was, about keeping up with the Joneses. That, was, some, that was something in those days. You're quite right, yes. yes. It's interesting you say that because our mum's, one of my mum's memories is the coronation and standing outside with other kids from her street, White House Street, standing outside. I think there was one family in the street that had a, a mum will tell me when I've got this right or wrong, had a television and standing outside looking through the window to see a little bit of the coronation. Well, yes, in, in those days, the screens weren't that bright no, either. And no. so, generally speaking, if it was in uh, daytime television, which there wasn't much yeah, of no, in those, no. those days, um, you had the curtains drawn. But uh, Coronation Day, well, that was, uh, that was a big special, day. Special, wasn't it? It was very it was special, special, yes, yes. Richard, what are your earliest memories of, of the TV? Oh, well, uh, when I was little, there was already a television in the house. I'm a 1954 baby. Yes. Um, but um, my mum and dad met in the war... And my mum came back and she was a children's nurse um, going round the schools in Birmingham, yeah. in the inner city. And as part Did of that, she ended up getting TB. Oh, so, really? And this was big news in, the, yes. uh, in 47, yes. 48. Yes. So when television came and was advertised to come to the Midlands from Sutton Coalfield, my dad, years before I was born, obviously bought a TV for her because part of the treatment was you had to be still Still, and whatever. So when I came along in 1954, there was already a television in the house. So I remember all sorts of kids shows and puppet shows, Miss Pemberton's Sweet Shop and things that you find difficult to find now um, that are out there. So uh, I grew up loving and wanting to be the voice on the telly because, you know, they treated it with reverence as something that you would watch. We didn't get, though, because we'd already got a telly in the house, when ITV came along, our telly was only one channel, black and white, 405 lines, only got the BBC. And my mum and dad didn't get the converter to get (laughs) Channel 8 from Litchfield, from Sutton Coalfield. So I had to go around to my mate Billy Benton's house to watch things on ITV (laughs) (laughs) if I wanted to see that. So I grew up only seeing Fireball XL5 um, at uh, at Billy's house. Precisely. (laughs) And it was the biggest news. I remember coming home from school, I must have been nine or ten, and we'd got one of the new tellies that could get the new BBC Two. And he'd had this big switch on the side that Plunked it from 405 yeah. to 625. So all of a sudden, having been in the dark ages yeah. of being the only lad at school that only got one channel now telly... Now you've got BBC Two as well. We've got all three. I, we I had, bet so. you were swanking around there, weren't you, Well, had, Terry? for at least half an hour, yes. <laughs> But uh, so, so that that's why, and I think my career, for what it is, <laughs> uh, being interested in television, working in radio and television, yeah. whatever, all came from just growing up because it was part of it, you know. And now to see the end of traditional television on yeah. the horizon yeah. is something yeah. that I hope this time we'll get onto. Is 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 sad for someone of my age, but um, we have seen a golden age of it. Well, we? it's interesting. I was two years after you, so fifty six. We're the same generation. We're the first real TV generation because you were what. 10 or 12 by the time you first got a TV, Terry? Yeah, 10. So you were the first ones that understood this was a, a fantastic thing. We kind of grew up with it, didn't we, Richard? Just yeah, that yeah, 10 yeah. a years yeah. difference makes a difference, doesn't it? Well, yes, in those days, Children's Hour was on the radio only. Yes, And yes. Uh, we used to listen to that with uh, Uncle Mac. Oh. Oh, you're too young for this sort of thing, Carl. But anyway, Much yeah. too young, isn't we, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think so what, what's interesting about 
what you're saying. This is the Babby really. talking now, Andrew. This is Chris Perry <laughs> coming in me. now. I think what's very interesting is that, uh, and, it, and it shows there's been a difference, certainly what, maybe 10 years between Terry and Richard, is that really what you were looking at with television back in those kind of very early 50s, late 40s, it was a real window on the world for many yeah. people yeah. You know, who actually thought yeah. that travelling from Dudley to Wensbury was, was going to the other side of the world. They had no idea at all what London looked like or Manchester yeah. or Liverpool. And television brought that, mm. in, that into their homes, it did. You know? And so watching something like The Coronation was the, the big thing you remember, but there were also you know, things like live outside broadcast of what it was to look like down a drain. Yeah. And people found that fascinating because they'd never done that before. Richard? I'd like to say, though, television was always special, right yeah. up and into the when it went colour in 1969, uh, 40 years ago, last November, this, this month's yeah. just gone, because it was controlled and there was only 50 hours a week yeah. of television. Yeah. So it closed down. Yeah. So you'd come home from school at lunchtime... We'd watch the test missed, signal, that wouldn't we? <laughs> Well, you had the radio, yes, and yeah, the radio. radio was still so important and vibrant. Yeah. And here in the Midlands, yeah. we were making radio dramas like Paul Temple yeah. that we spoke yeah. to the world with. It was the yeah. sort of the crossroads mm, equivalent and, and in radio well. terms we from years before. To American Forces Network. We were listening to yeah. Radio Luxembourg, yeah. Radio yeah. Caroline. Yes. You know, there was a, a. It was an exciting era for radio as well, but wasn't the, it? The other quick point about growing up with television was when I was little, I had to go to bed at seven o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, and I did. So, but I would then listen to the radio, so I'd yeah. listen to these dramas yeah. and these quiz programmes yeah. on the radio. So you only saw a little bit of television when you were I, th- I think that's, that's also a very interesting point, Richard, because, I mean, part of the, the, the brief of television f- from the, the days of Lord Reith, really, was about the, the educational nature yes. of it. And that yes. was why it wasn't on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because it, you, you concentrated your efforts on putting the best possible quality into what you were actually broadcasting, but you left time within the rest of the day for people to go and do other things, yes. you know, so yep. they, they could do their studying, they could do their the so socialising, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and in some senses, that, that that is what can be lost by modern television yes. and radio as well, to a certain extent, so easily because because now children can literally sit there from morning to night just watching yeah. TV, and it ceased to be educational. I know that as an educator. I, I was it was interesting though one of the points that you made, Chris, which I think was a, a very important one, that television opened up the world. Yes, absolutely. Because my dad's first memory of a TV. Would we have got BBC One before the Sutton Cove Holfield transmitter? No. 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 So no, it would have been so. fifty. So it would have been sixty years ago. Yes. And so my great grandmother was still alive, and Dad said, "My granddad, who was an ex Coldstream guardsman from the First World War, old contemptible, bought a TV specifically because he wanted to see the trooping of the collar in London, yeah. and it was the Coldstream guards were trooping the collar. Mm. So it's got to have been that year that you had, you know, yeah. The, the, yeah. this year, yeah. sixty F- years ago, fifty fifty one, I think. I'd yeah. Say. Yeah. Right. yeah. And. So it's got to be fifty fifty one. And Dad said it was the meeting of, looking back now as an older man, of two ages. Great Granny Chin come down the stairs, the steep stairs, with the door at the bottom. Granddad had got the TV in the corner, Chris. She opened the door and was transfixed. Dad said there was this woman who's grown up in the 1870s, yes. 80s, yes. could not comprehend that what she was seeing on the TV was happening at the same time in London. Absolutely. She was absolutely amazed by it. Yes, I, I, I mean, I think you only have to look at that when you look back at some of the old TV programmes. Now you watch, look at The Saint, for instance. Yes. You know, and they would they start off with some stock film of Buenos Aires or something. Yeah. People would genuinely have believed that was, you know, yeah. um, Argentina or whatever, yeah. because people had never been there. No. You know, television no. gave them the opportunity to explore the world in kind of all sorts of yeah. wide ways and really with the Southern Coalfield Transmitter opening it was the beginning of the, the ability of the English regions to start making programmes of their own you know yes. to put onto television to kind of showcase what they did you know um, in ways that had never been there before if you look at the original service with Sylvia Peters from Alexandra Palace back in London that, that, that was an incredibly uh, Oxford educated yeah. frightfully yeah. upper class kind of part, part of Britain their, their perceptions but once they started opening the regional transmitters like Sutton Coalfield other people could start making programmes yes. as well and so you also began to break down the class barriers of so society R- R- There were 155,000 television licences in the London region before Sutton Coalfield opened yeah. and it was £2 for a television licence Which was a lot of money And when Sutton Coalfield opened within two years it had doubled the income for the BBC so the the opening yeah. of these regions started to enrich the corporation as well. So it could make 
bigger and better. So things. was the opening of the Sutton Coalfield one the first regional one, or was it happening all around? No, first. The first. The first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. That's yeah. really important, isn't it, as a, as it, from a historical point of view, Chris? Ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, I, mean they, I, I guess it, if you think about it, it's, it was a natural choice. Birmingham was the second city after yeah. London, and therefore it was your biggest concentration of, of viewers or listeners yes. to, co- you know, to open a, a TV um, kind of regional base. And in fact, I mean, Birmingham is still regarded now as the base of the English regions in terms of its television and radio output, even yes. though a lot of it isn't made here anymore. No. It's still regarded as, as the actual kind of headquarters for that very same reason. So that, that persists six years later and it, it was because there was a large concentration of people here who, who could buy TV licences you know uh, and also the, a large range of what call even then a large range of cultural diversity about the Birmingham area you know uh, areas of countryside yes. area, urban areas yeah, urban, urban, rural you know, in a absolutely yeah. different strata of, of society from the from borders from of Wales areas. absolutely yeah. yeah I mean the original English region as we think of it was not the West Midlands you think of it now it went out as far as Norwich and yes. as you said right up the borders of Wales so yep. it covered a huge swathe of the centre of yeah. the country that became accessible there you know and, and that demographic was very important to BBC because it was trying to kind of broaden its base it knew that it couldn't keep pitching operas all day to just just to people you know who'd been to to, to, to it went to Glyndebourne. It had to pitch itself out in a more regional way. So and things at like the Archers that began in 1948 was part of that process. And technically, it was exciting for people because it was the first mast, the base of the set, Sutton Coalfield transmitter. We're sitting around a, a large round table here, aren't we? It's about the same size. It wasn't a uh, a tower. It was a mast. Yeah. And so technically it was at the forefront of something. And at its time it was the most powerful transmitter in the world, mm. Sutton Coalfield. The, the aerial incidentally uh, supported on a two-inch diameter ball bearing. The whole of that mass sits on a two-inch diameter really? ball bearing. That's remarkable. So the thing could twist and turn a little bit. But uh, famous photographs show the, the placing of this ball bearing <laughs> into its socket onto which the mast uh, was... So from your perspective, Teddy, would you agree with Chris and Richard that technologically, socially, culturally, this was a ground breaking event, the opening of the Sutton Coalfield Transmitter. Oh indeed, it moved stuff from the capital into the country um, I don't mean the country, countryside No, the, the, country the, the country is a place. The whole Yes of course, but uh, to get the pictures and so on from London uh, they came by a one way link uh, First of all I think it was done on uh, via 12, uh, 12 masts uh, which carried the uh, the pictures and the sound from London to Birmingham, where they were then radiated from the transmitter. And if you wanted to send anything down to London, as they did from time to time, they had to go through a ceremony known as reversing the link. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on this piece of film that I saw, and uh, any engineers listening will realise how quaint this was, the, um, the chap in charge said, uh, Mr Engineer, uh, we're about to reverse the link. Would you check the waveform? And the uh, engineer would say, waveform is fine, OK, go ahead, reverse the link. And, of course, the, the, uh, the radio transmitters and later on the large uh, coaxial cable which carried the signal uh, from London to, to Birmingham, uh, they, they had to change the connections round, so they stopped sending it from London and they sent it back down the cable to... Um, uh, back to uh, to London and back to Birmingham again. Um, quite a quite a quaint process. Do you think they were aware of their pioneering endeavours, or was it just people just getting on with it? I think it's very much they were they were doing a job that they were they were put. Uh, put to do. I mean, just before coming here this, after, uh, this afternoon, this morning, I was chatting to Tony Pilgrim, who, Tony Pilgrim, was in fact uh, in charge of setting up links and so on. He was, uh, let me see, he was called the, um, uh, oh gosh, I made a note of it here. He, he, they were called links in those days. Yes. Links, uh, sometimes called uh, lines and, and so on. But, um, he was in charge of the, the switching centre, which was responsible for yeah. remoting the um, the programmes from one place to another. And he was telling me that um, a lot of the stuff which came from the Midlands area uh, was essentially from OB trucks, outside broadcast vehicles. And indeed, the uh, uh, TV studio, which was set up in Goster Green... Yeah, yeah the old Alicia picture house. That's the one. Yeah. Um, that essentially was a large room. They cleared out the cinema and they made yeah. it into a uh, studio floor. Yeah. And the uh, the electronic stuff was in in trucks, you know, the uh, the OB vehicles outside. 
Imagine. Richard, you were going to, that question I asked Terry, you've got a thought on that. Did, did they, were they aware of their pioneering? Oh, I don't think so, no. no. I think that the, um, the, uh, it, it was described as in the opening sequence, wasn't it, that we heard as uh, this experiment of television. Yeah. And it continued to be an experiment um, until they'd got a small network of, of other transmitters going. And it took four or five years for them to uh, to get something like 90% of the coverage, didn't it, around the uh, around the United yeah. Kingdom? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because ITV was coming along. Yes, yeah. and they had to so they, yeah. Absolutely. They weren't going to, you know, be left racing behind ITV, so racing to catch Chris, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, uh, I think that, that, that was an interesting point about what uh, you were saying about, about were they pioneers or not, because if you look at kind of the modern media today and the fact that people are desperate to get into it and people kind of want, you know, two, two degrees and 400 postgrad qualifications to become a producer at the BBC, uh, we have talked an awful lot to different people who worked in TV in those early pioneering days. Most of them fell into it by accident. Yeah. But most of them were actually people who were out of work or they were in advertising or ad agencies, they had an idea, and someone would just say, you're hired. Right, you, yeah. you, you, you're a TV director now, you know, and so and there was that kind of real pioneering nature about it. Some but people, without them realising it, pioneering. Some people did yeah. the t- did did, did the yeah. kind of technical side just because they were they were that they enjoyed you know being geeks and messing around with the actual cables and all the rest of it. For the people making the programmes, they had no real idea what they were doing at all in many regards, and they were just putting together things they thought people would like to see and, and be interested by. And, and in many ways, be, through that kind of innocence almost of their yeah, approach, yeah. they tapped into yeah. the. Feelings of the nation because they are actually part of the absolutely, nation. Absolutely, yeah. That maybe modern broadcasters yes. don't always yeah. feel that same connection. Because they're too professional, perhaps. Terry, how did you get into the game? Well, when I was at school, I got a book out of the library which uh, was about television and uh, television engineering, and I thought this is really something for me. And uh, I think it was a few weeks after that that I went uh, with my father down to the, the Gossard Green Studios. I went down onto the studio floor and saw these guys with the cameras doing all the things yeah. I'd read about yeah. in the book. Yeah. And for me, that, that was, was that was television. I was, yeah. I was hooked, you know, and I have been ever since. So when would that have been, roughly, Terry? Well, uh, that, when I went down there, I suppose it would be about 57, 58. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were babies then, Richard, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Terry, I've got busy that way. I, I, I went um, <laughs> about 1960, I think. I went to the BBC for uh, an interview yeah. uh, to, uh, to join up for, as a technician or television engineer. In their infinite wisdom, they decided I was not for, the, not for television, not for a television career. And it wasn't until probably about 1963, 64 when uh, an opportunity opened up at um, ATV, as it was, yeah. and down at uh, Aston, that uh, Jerry Kay, the chief engineer, um, I think a philanthropic sort of guy who liked to take uh, fledglings under his yeah. wing, yeah. Uh, he took me on, and uh, the, as I say, the rest is history. I never looked back. So really, Chris, your point, which was a very important one, about there weren't these professionals that would come in. Terry was for the first generation of professional people that yes, were learning absolutely. from the, the people that had kind of drifted into it in some way or other. Absolutely. Uh, I think I, I think the, the fascinating thing about television, I suppose, in nowadays is that it's very technology-driven. Yes. Think about the last 10 years, the yeah. move towards digital and high definition and, yeah. and 3D television, yeah. etc. Yeah. It's now been driven by, by the kind of technical bods and what they can come up with. Yeah. You know, and the next generation will probably be internet-based television, whereas I think 50 years ago, the drive was very much from the programme makers, actually, it was, you know, and, and a very different turnaround. Yeah. And, and, and very often they, they did shows sometimes with virtually no money and virtually no equipment very yeah. often you know um just because they had good ideas and they wanted to try and get the ideas i mean you mentioned tingle and tucker earlier yeah. you know in at the idea that, that came from reg watson the, the old AT, AT, atv producer who as i understand it <laughs> it began just as part of the normal continuity that ran at atv television yeah. it wasn't a, a program as such they were just filling time between, between the programs. programs and gene morton in a, 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 was looking for some angle reading out letters from children trying to get the audience involved interact as they'd call it nowadays, of course, you know. And Red Watson produced these two little koala bear toys that he yeah. brought back from Australia with him, you know. How did we think and, the gum said, tree and koala bears and, were so out of our know, ken? He said, use these to, to, just to, to try and get some interaction with, yeah. with, with the kids, because if you get the kids watching, you get the parents watching as well. And out of that grew the whole idea of the Tinker and Tucker Club, you know. Uh, it, there, there was no kind of pre-planning. It wasn't kind of thought through by no. 1,400 no. Mark, market yeah. focus groups. What do we need to do now? You know, it, it, it purely came out it was of organic. filling time. Organic. It, it had to stop at one point, because they used to have um, an AGM at Sutton 
park, didn't they? Or there was one. And at one point, they'd got more than half a million members of the Tinger and Tucker Club. <laughs> And the police couldn't control the traffic and the parking. We had or a whatever. little badge as well, That's didn't right, we? Yeah, with the ATV logo That's on and the two bears in black and white. It, and because <laughs> it was very special, you see, ATV and ABC for for for, for a lot of us, because my mum's from Aston. So where they were based, the old Astoria Picture House, that was our mum's picture house. So mm. there was a real, um, you know, Gloucester Green with the BBC at the Astoria with ATV, ABC. There was a real sense that it, it, it belonged to us in perhaps a way that TV doesn't feel that way today. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something very poignant about the Tinker and Tucker side. I mean, as Richard said, hugely phenomenal, you know, a massively important um, social phenomena. Only one survives. You know, if you were trying to actually find out about Tinker and Tucker now, if, if you were today's generation, only one episode, Carl, of that has actually survived. Really? From all of those editions Isn't shown and broadcast. And that, and, and that that is part of what we do as Kaleidoscope. Yeah. We try, we try to, to salvage the past in many ways. I, I going through people's lofts yeah. and, and, and skips. Making appeals and, to and people. Absolutely, you know, coming yeah. on programmes like this, you know. Yeah. To, but because we have people who, who sometimes may have things in lofts or in cupboards that they don't know what they are. Yeah. But, but we're discovering a lot of the past is actually missing. I mean, some of the yeah. stuff that we brought along to today for well, you music, after the uh, travel. music-wise to listen to was rescued from Pebble Mill when the building there was demolished yeah. and it went in skips and people just took it out of the skips again. You know, and now it's coming back on the air today because yeah. we're playing some music for you. And it just staggers you, Terry, that you know, we know, we've known we lost such a lot in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, but there's been so much said about how we should be preserved the past and yet, even up to a few years ago when Pebble Mill was being knocked down, stuff was still being skipped. Because, Absolutely. and a lot of the ATV material uh, disappeared because it was too expensive to keep. It was run as a very um, well-run commercial proposition, the, the yes. commercial TV station. The tapes cost a lot of money. They could be reused, so they were reused. And there were very right. strong union agreements. Yeah. The ACTT, um, equity, etc., um, wouldn't allow programmes to go out again without... Repayment. They wanted to keep their work, their their members of the union in work. Yes. So it was going to be cheaper to remake the programmes right. or to make new programmes than to repeat the old ones. Mm. So it cost a lot to keep them. It didn't make commercial sense to keep them. Yeah. Terry, we were talking about Tinker and Tucker. I worked on that programme. It was one of the first things I did. And um, and Crossroads. But uh, the uh, the studio that the programme came from was not as big as this and it was quite a cramped affair and uh, there was Auntie Jean with her trying to disguise her script that she was, <laughs> she was reading from she uh, was and the puppeteer sort of lying <laughs> down behind the piano and it, it, it was quite hilarious but the, um, the characters' voices were recorded, pre-recorded on, um, on a tape machine and they were edited together and of course they, they were sped up by a factor of two so uh, it was all sort of high pitch and garbled and nobody could really make out what yeah. was being said. I, all I remember is that they had kind of squeaky voices yep. and soccer. but there's an interesting point to this Carl because um, they were quite a quite an, an amusing team and the language that they put in occasionally was, should we say, a bit fruity <laughs> but we, we got away with it simply because nobody could make head or tail of it. That is until some old guy who lived across the road from the studio, got, having nothing better to do with his time, then got an audio tape recorder and recorded the sound, there was no video recording in those days not domestically, <laughs> he recorded the soundtrack uh, and on played, a reel to reel. On a reel to reel recorder, he played them back at the natural speed, and he could hear what oh, was being said. No. So, uh, a rather stiff letter or phone call went across to Frank Beale, who was in charge in those days. Said, Do you realise what is going out in children's <laughs> programmes? So a fizzer came down from Frank, and they had to uh, change their ways a little bit. So instead of running the tape at um, twice the speed of what they recorded it at uh, it, it was reduced to two thirds and the words became very much more intelligible and the style of the, the presentation changed Saved. a little bit as a result of no that. No they didn't keep any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen we're going to go to some music before that Moggy Bride of Wally's wrong in and said Teddy was talking about working at or going to Gloucester Green and working at Gloucester Green he said do you remember uh Auto Road Springs, run by Bob, that was underneath the studios at Gloucester Green. No, I don't. No. I'm sorry. Never no. mind, Terry. Never mind. Listen, let's play some more music. Then we'll probably go up to the travel, and then we're going to come back. We've got some TV music to play mm. that Chris has kindly brought in with him. You're with Carl Chin on BBC WM. That's going to be a great other side of coming up with Ed Doonan a little bit later on. I'm in conversation with three smashing chaps who are 
illuminating us with their memories of broadcasting and one young chap who is illuminating us with his social historical perspective from afar. <laughs> How's that, Chris Perry? Did you like that one? Uh, well, I've never been described like that before, actually. It has been said that you are totally unique. <laughs> Chris, just before you introduce a, a montage of, of tunes for us, you're a teacher as well, aren't you? That's your yes, that's right. Job. I'm a deputy head. Yeah, where right. at? Uh, I'm down at Greston Primary School yeah. in Hansworth Wood. Yeah. And I've been there for about four years now. And, uh, and so the re- this, this interest in television history is very much... Uh, uh, Outside, yes, a- absolutely. I mean, I think probably apart from maybe a few children and parents listening to your program now, who probably would have no idea at all that I spend so much of my time <laughs> in people's attics and, and writing books and uh, doing columns, the Express and Star, and yeah. all sorts of other things. Yeah. Kaleidoscope started about twenty-one years ago, and we've seen the rise and fall of broadcasting. Really, we've yeah. seen the people we know, you know, uh, lose their jobs, regain new jobs, lose their jobs, regain their jobs. TV companies come and go over the years, and what we've tried to do is provide some kind of continuity through yeah. all that, both in terms of the social historical perspective yeah. but also just in terms of preserving a lot of the actual material for the future. Where did that love spring from? It, it, it sprung from me what, watching I suppose, uh, the start of what was the, the kind of old television repeat on daytime yeah. central television yeah. in, in the kind of late 1970s, early 1980s, shows like Random Hopkirk, Deceased yeah. and The Baron yeah. that yeah. were suddenly shown yeah. and, and also from a kind of realisation that uh, the shows like, like that I'd loved watching when I was young, like say Pipkins made by ATV with old Hartley Hair, had kind of gone really and would have gone forever unless someone came along and yeah. tried to resurrect them again and a lot of what we've tried to do is keep alive a lot of the memories uh, of the last few years and, and this musical montage that yes. we put together for you today is exactly that when people listen to it now it will bring back lots of memories of all the great classic programmes shown in, in, the, in the Midlands region made by the Midlands region in the last 50 years here we go then <laughs>
Well, no, I won't, I won't blow the bubble on you, Richard, over that one. I promise yeah. you. Chris, just go through those quickly, because I'm sure they've stirred a lot of memories for the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. The, the first one was the ATV opening March. Yeah. I'm sure many people I remember that well. remember that from the start of ATV. The second one was my personal favourite from Pebble Mill. Yeah. Pebble Mill at one. And yeah. Pebble Mill was such an iconic building, really. You know, uh, sad it's not there anymore. Third one, of course, that was the 70s version of the X Factor, New yes. Faces. Yeah. And, and indeed, the X Factor was no different to New Faces, really, in terms of the kind of style it created fourth one many people may not realise was Pop Black the, the old snooker Very, yes. game which came from yeah. BBC Birmingham that, yes. that was one of our and Pop Black really put snooker onto the, to the the national radar of sports absolutely and indeed Come Dancing was started <coughs> yes. by, by, by the Midlands as well oh. and now of course that's very big restricted Come Dancing Crossroads was number five yeah a totally iconic theme to there Angels Yes. Okay. Which was very typical of a lot of drama that was made actually in this region that wasn't all, always Birmingham based. I mean, and yeah. things like uh, Pen Marrick was also yeah. based here at one point, and Poldart was based here, and Doctor Who was based here for a while. Tis was. Yeah. Okay, we, which we began very much as a piece of continuity from, from ATV. All Creatures Great and Small. Shot in Yorkshire, but, but made from the Midlands. Avid as M. Pet. Yeah, that's an extremely that was iconic. A fantastic series. Clement and the Frenny. Top Gear. Something that, that now, of course, has sadly been taken off us, really, and taken to London as a programme. The Cloves Show began here, the Cloves yeah. Show theme, which yeah. is why it's still based in Birmingham at, at the NEC. Peak Practice, Dangerfield, and Inspector Morse Very to finish good. off. I'm coming to Richard in a moment, but we've had some lovely texts coming in. Chris Ean showed us a car. We were the first on our road in Dublin with a telly, 1958. I love Robin Hood, so did I. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Absolutely with band yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so I used to cha charge all the kids penny, <laughs> Chris <laughs> did, to come in and watch, and I hate me to watch through the window. <laughs> So funny to look back. Very happy days. God bless Chrissy and Sheldon. Thanks, Chrissy. Yes. John Hart also in Sheldon says, Carl, in the 1950s, not many families could afford televisions. But Johnny Kennedy, known as the county, was a famed market trader in Birmingham. He lived in Compton Street, Carl, and he had two TVs in the living room, one on top of the other, one tuned into BBC, <laughs> the other to ATV, to stop any arguments. Great story, John. And thank you to Lily Walsall. Morning, Carl. When I was younger... Our television took us so long to warm up. We used to watch su Sunday nights at the London Palladium on a Thursday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> That's very funny. Absolutely brilliant, Lynn. Merry Christmas to all of you. And Nicky in Sedgwick, Carl, I'm 44 and I was a member of the Tinker and Tucker Club. I've still got my badge, my boomerang, and my picture of Auntie Jean and Tinker and Tucker. Thank you, Nicky in Sedgley. <laughs> Richard, Chris is obviously very much involved in trying to salvage Progress about you're involved as well in that kind of thing, aren't well, you? Well, sort of. I've taken on looking uh, for uh, film libraries that are, are lost as well. Uh, so not necessarily Midlands or yes. Birmingham based, uh, but I, I uh, managed to get the Bain collection. So I'm the proud owner of Telly Savalas looks at Birmingham, but 119 other films, and I've just got DVDs out of. Uh, swinging UK and UK Swings Again. This is Lulu singing Shout. It's Millie with My Boy oh, Lollipop. Yeah. And these films would have been lost, um, but they're colour 35mm originals. And I'm hoping that Sky, um, I know I shouldn't say that it's here, all right. so but they're going to help me um, uh, make these transmittable on television again and make them into oh, HD. Richard, how excited are you and about that? I own Michael Winner's earliest film, The Cool Mikado, which stars Frankie Howard and Tommy <laughs> Cooper. And should any of you search for it on the internet, you'll find it is indeed the worst film in the world, <laughs> which is why you should rush out and order your copy <laughs> off. Of. But I brought them for you, Carl, to have a look at. Oh, thank you. He really knows how to sell a product, really, doesn't he? But this, is the best part. This one, Swinging UK, is brilliant because you've got the animals, Swinging Blue Jeans, the Apple Jacks, were a Birmingham oh, yes, group. Oh, yes, yes. A uh, Soul Yola thing, actually, they were, weren't yes, they? they were. Lulu and the Lovers, Herman's Hermits, the Hollies, who were just yeah. phenomenal, so, the Tremolos. That's a cracker, that so one. So we're trying to save stuff from all over the place here. And, and hopefully uh, in the next year or so we could see these on, on the TV You again. just might do. I'm also involved with the Delphi films, and this is uh, 30 films made for the British uh, cinema, starring Diana Dawes, Sid James. Yeah. It's the first performance of Rolf Harris on film, etc. And they're going to come out as well, slowly. They are Peter Sellers' first film is just out, so I'm, I'm uh, working with groups that do that as if well. If people want to find out more about these films and the others, what should they do? Oh, crikey. They can look website? at the uh, there is my website, yes. BAME, B A I M, BAMEFilms.com, or Adelphi Films. BAME or Adelphi Films. Or you just search on your favourite search engine, Google or whatever, yeah. and you'll find it on there somewhere thank you, if you Richard. really want to. Richard, it'd be great having you today. Well, thank you. In the studio with us, thank you. 
Chris, you've got to say something. No, we did, did the TV equivalent. We hold the Bob Monkhouse collection, <laughs> which Bob Monkhouse's family gave to us after he passed away. And, and, and that is very much uh, the television equivalent of yeah. what, what Rich is going on yeah. with the film side. You know, and that is something that we're spending a lot of time now. We, we've had to digitise it and, and yeah. kind of make it available back, back to broadcasters again. Very hopeful a lot of that will go out on BBC Seven. And if you want to find out more about, about that, we're at kaleidoscope.org.uk. And that tells us a bit more about us and what we do. Thank you for being with us today, Chris. Terry, when you started, when you saw your first television programme all them years ago as a 10 year old. Oh, cracky. Yeah. Hey, and now you look back at a career, <laughs> a distinguished career, may I add? Well, indeed, I mentioned the coronation, and I said I was absolutely gobsmacked and overwhelmed by that. And. Uh, when, in more recent years, I started my own business, I do quite a bit of work transferring films and things yeah. uh, for the BBC. Somebody called me and said, we need some bits and pieces out of the uh, uh, coronation. Uh, if we send some film to you, can you do it? Um, I said, well, yeah, I'll do my best. And a few days later, a van turned up and a huge pile of these great 35 mil cans arrived on my doorstep. <laughs> And uh, I took out the uh, recorded and transferred the bits that were needed. But as a youngster of yeah. 10 or 11, I would never have imagined in my wildest no. dreams no. that the material that I was watching, and of course it was recorded on film in those days, yeah. no, no videotape in those days, Carl, um, would have come into my hands for me yeah. to lovingly put through my what, equipment. I, and what a, a, a beautiful and most apt way to bring the start and the end of a programme together. <laughs> There's Teddy as a 10, 11 year old watching the coronation and towards the end of his career, there he is, now got the cans from the coronation. It was great. Teddy, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. I've really enjoyed having all of you with us.